here, and this is the last, um, the last Sabbath of the last day of the year. So happy New Year's Eve day. Let's uh, start with prayer. Fathers, we bow before you and uh, contemplate, Lord, all the wonders that you prepared for us. We pray that you might turn our hearts and our thoughts to you. And we thank you for these things in your name. Amen. All things new. How's that sound? Other than I don't like new things. <laughs> I get used to one restaurant, I want to go back. <laughs> I'm not a, not a real adventurous guy. Well, yes, that's right. If you see what really is new, it would be good. I, um, I want to start with the verse and then we'll sidetrack a little. Because I tried to think, how can we like summarize the whole quarter? We're talking about death in little print, death, dying, and in big print, the future hope. So we've made it to the future hope today. But I couldn't help but reflect on making sure we get to the right point here. Because I mean, we could, you could present heaven from a very selfish perspective, right? I mean, streets of gold, mansion. I mean, all these things, you just appeal to the sinful heart, right? I mean, who wouldn't want to be there? You know, and so at some point we can, we got to be careful how we do that. Because um, Jesus, on the one hand, he said to Peter, Right, very troubled. I mean, he just told Peter, just told him I'm going to go to die, and he told Peter, "You're going to deny me tonight, three times." And he said, "No, I never will." And Jesus said, "Yes, you will." When the cock crows, and the very next words from Jesus' mouth were what? Remember? So we put a chapter in there. So John 13, you're going to deny me. Then we go to John 14. So John didn't write it in chapters. The very next words out of Jesus' mouth was, "Let not your heart be troubled." If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. And if it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And so that's what we're going to talk about, this preparing the place for you. But in the most troubled time when he told Peter, right before his way to the cross, he wanted to stop and, and present to this this hope of, um, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And that's my mom. You know, I, I heard she just house burnt down. It's been five months now, I think. Um, burned down completely. And that was her home. She moved in when she was eight years old. And so, I mean, she was counting on sitting on that chair watching the sunset or going to the front of the house and watching the water thing. The steps were facing the east. Watching the sunset or watching the water thing. She was ready to go. And the house was gone. And remind her mom, you know, that, that, that whatever you love about that home, All right. Well, back again. Sorry if you missed that at home. We're back in on the road again. <laughs> I was uh, talking about my my father was in a coma. He he fell off a sailboat, um, died by the sea. Loved the sea. He sailed around the world twice before he was eighteen years old, with the Merchant Marines in the in World War II. At the end of it, and he loved the sea. Lived on a lake. When he was 60 some years old, he volunteered six weeks to be on a working vacation on a, on a fishing boat in Alaska just because he loved the sea. And he died at the sea. You know, he was, he was taking his boat out of the water and his sailboat and he somehow fell, slipped backwards onto the asphalt and broke his neck, his back, bled into his brain. So he's in a coma, um, but not, not living, not breathing. And so, I went to his bedside and um, asked his wife, are you gonna have like some kind of ceremony for him? You know, when, when he passes away, she was Catholic. He was, well, I'll stay here. He was raised Adventist, but um, not practicing for a long time. Never, never felt God could have enough grace 
for all the things he had done. Um, I think his mom, bless her heart, my grandma, ingrained that into him. You'd made such horrible mistakes. And, um, come back. He never thought he could come back because they had made such horrible mistakes. But he loved to hear about the grace of God. And I, I, he was at Grove. Come, popped in one day at Grove when I happened to be preaching. And um, driving a car back. He was retired. But for extra income or just to keep busy, he'd fly to Florida in the, in the whenever it'd be springtime and drive cars back for rental car places. Everyone would, you know, they'd had to get them down south for the winter. Now they're more in north Florida to Minnesota. And he stopped in. He said, unannounced, I'm, I'll be at, at, you know, coming through Kentucky. Can I stay at your house for a day or two? And his wife was there. And like she had this grip on him um, that wanted to keep him away, I think, from, from the Lord. But, um, and it was Sabbath was coming up. So you come to church at Grove, it was at Grove years ago. And I happened to be preaching. And I, God knew this ahead of time. I didn't, uh, that he was coming. So I prepared a sermon on Isaiah 55. Why do you spend money for that which isn't good? You know, come to me and eat bread and, and all the good things. And I know the thoughts I have for you, you know, as high as a, and all of that, that God come, come to him and he could have uh, pardon. We could pardon him. You know, all that was in that verse. And he just, he soaked it in, my dad, you know. And he um, told me afterwards how much that meant. And I, I knew I, he just had, had a heart very open to God. He just felt very unworthy to be there, much like the thief on the cross. You know, could you remember me? I mean, could, I don't know if it, could you remember me? And, and it was the humble people that, Jesus always accepted. Um, let the heavy laden and the weary come to me and the woman at his feet, they were all criticizing. How could you ever let someone like that at your feet? He said, these are the people that love to come to me. And they criticized him one day. You know, whoa, this, this proves you couldn't be the Messiah. Because look at all that trash at your feet. And he stopped and told him three stories. Remember Luke 15? Told him three stories about, let me tell you a little story about God and the kind of people he likes to have come to him. Told us worried about the lost sheep. And it was all the story. It wasn't about the lost sheep. It was about the shepherd. The shepherd seeking for the lost sheep. And one about the lost coin. It was about the woman seeking the lost coin. And one about the prodigal son. It was about the father who longed for his two boys. And it was all about the father's love. And Jesus told him about the love. And God, my father loved to hear that. And so I remember he was laying in bed now. And, um, and his wife, I said, we, are you going to have some service? And I think surely dad wouldn't want a Catholic priest to come. And she said, oh, he didn't want a service. He wanted to just be cremated. And so we just thought we'd let you do something in the room. And, um, and then she adds, as only, bless her heart, his wife could add. She said, um, and keep it short. Like, don't make it too long. <laughs> don't make it too long. Like, okay, give me a little credit. And so I, I had, you know, a mixed group of people, her children, his, um, some of his children, one child that they had together around the bedside, and they had, we'd probably never had peace together before, so why now? But we were getting ready to extubate him. He had passed away, being kept alive just by the ventilator. But he was still there, you know, still breathing. And I had a chance to give this sermon. And I thought, or a little memory, and I think, okay, it's got to be something about the sea, because my dad loved the sea, and he died. So I, I, I think it was three Ps of the sea. And one was God's, um, I remember this, one was God's um, pardon, you know, that I will take your, your sins and I can bury them in the depths of the sea. And, and my dad loved to hear that. I knew he knew that. You know, that, that somehow, as unworthy as he felt, God could take and remove his sins as far as the uh, east is from the west and could put him in the depths of the sea, just far from you. He said, boy, boy, you move it just from me, God. I don't care if it's six inches. Just get it away from me. But, but the depths of the sea, that's a long ways. And my dad loved to hear that. And then the peace, God's peace. And I talked to, I think, from Psalm something 103 or 4, uh, where Jesus quoted this. I mean, it was a troubled boat, you know, and they were out and the, and the disciples were, were, um, were um, 
unhappy grumbling about something and Jesus was sound asleep in the back of the boat and the storm came up. And remember what he said? This, and they said, carest thou not that we die, that we perish? I mean, do, don't you care about us? That was, that was one of my verses I was thankful for in my trial. Carest thou not? And, and of course he cared and he stood up and he quoted this psalm. And it says, peace be still. I mean, that was in the Psalms. David wrote that. Troubled water and the waves crashing over. And he spoke, peace be still. And it was calm and they were at the shore. And so I said that to my, my dad. You know, I said, you know, he found some peace in his life. He had a lot of troubled times. Um, divorce, unhappy. You know, we all know the stress that he had, I said. But I said, he came to know that there's great peace when you come to the Lord. And... He didn't think God could forgive him, but he knew that's where he's going to have peace. Um, we were sitting in his boat once again, sailboat, same sailboat we died on. Uh, once we visited him in, on Lake Minnetonka, beautiful lake outside Minneapolis, 100 mile shoreline. And uh, he lived on that lake. And we're out there, and he patted his little boat, and he said, This is as close to heaven as I'm going to get. Um, it was peaceful for him. But he didn't ever feel like he could be there. He didn't ever felt worthy for that. That was before he heard me preach. But I, I knew his heart well enough that that just felt unworthy. And God loves humble, unworthy people. Um, he doesn't like proud people. They can't help them because they're proud. So anyway, I talked about God's peace. And I said, you know, that dad had come to, to know that peace in his life. He had peace. He quit drinking. And, you know, he settled down. And he, he, um, he had peace. He had peace that comes only from God. And it's peace like that sea that was so calm. And um, then I, the third P was about paradise. And I talked a little about heaven. And, and I still remember this. And I, and I, I covered his ears up because I said this word. And, and I read John and I said, and there'll be no more sea. And for my dad, for John, that was good news because he was stuck on this rock on the middle of the ocean, you know, in the sea. And like, that's all he could see. And it separated from everything that was dear to him, from his beloved church. And, and John was just stuck there. And so he, first thing he noticed, there's no more sea. And for my dad, that would not be good, you know. But where there says there's no more sea, there's also what? A sea of glass mixed with fire, right? So there's there, the lake of fire. I mean, the lake it was like a fire, but there's a sea of glass mixed with fire. And I think maybe somehow the place he's preparing for my dad will be there. You know, and, and I said this, I said, somewhere on that sea of glass, maybe he's got a home that he can, he can uh, see the glory of the Lord reflecting on that. I remember we were in Peru um, on a mission trip, and Anna and I went with, we thought they were like headhunters, you know, it was like 40 years earlier, but we were on the Amazon, you know, we went up and stopped in this little village, and we had no idea who they were, and we were on a boat trip, and we said, I don't know what they said in Spanish, medicine or whatever and and the people said yeah they wanted help so we got up there and this the chief you know who was the mayor who was the kindergarten teacher but you know but what area you're in he was and, and we had, but they didn't know these people we just there we helped him one day and then in the evening it was getting close to sunset he asked if andy and i want to go out in a boat with him I'm like okay he's gonna like drown us or something <laughs> but we said, okay we'll go out I and mean, we knew him well enough he had a translator so we went in this boat and went down a little tributary of the river off the Amazon. And, and then he went there, I don't know, 20 minute ride. And then he turned right onto this lake. And it was like a sea of glass. And my camera, my, my battery had run dead. So I, I just got the picture right here. Um, it was one of those, su sun was just setting. We just had a, a rainstorm, thunder, like a, in the rainforest, had a thunderstorm, rainforest. The clouds were there and the sun was setting. And it was one of those like whole sky, golden, orange, yellow, pink color. And it reflected completely on the lake. I mean, it was like a double, it, it was just gorgeous. And I thought, I'm gonna remember this. And somehow I thought, I told my dad, you know, somehow maybe have that home on the, on the edge of the sea of glass and you'll be able to see God's glory always reflected in it. And that was heaven. And but that was my little sermon, you know, a little, close at, at the end of his life, you know, and, and I expect to see him there someday. And what is there about heaven that we like? So I, I like, got this verse. It's a long way to get in this verse. First Corinthians um, 2. 
1 Corinthians 2, 9. And we use this often, and we don't always read the next verse. Um, and you should always read the verses right ahead and behind, right? Yeah. You wanna, until you finally get to the front of the Bible and the back of the Bible. Then you're going to understand it better. And we've tried to do that this quarter. So we, we'll go through some of that. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. So I'm going to read that. All right, so, I mean, there it is, and it's quoted, so we don't have time. I didn't even look up, but it's, it's quoted from the Old Testament, so he's quoting something that has been written, and it's in italics in my version. Not italics, but bold print. So it was written somewhere. Um, that I has not seen, neither has ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man what God, all that God has prepared for him. First, we just reflect on that, right? I mean, that all that God has prepared for them. But what does the next verse say? But these things God has revealed to us through his spirit. So, and then he goes on and makes this point about the natural man, the spiritual man, the natural man. And this goes down to verse 14, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned. So that's why we need God's spirit. So all the glories of heaven. In particular, the great love that's there, right? I mean, God's law, love God, love man, it, that's, that's, that's his kingdom right there. And everything is in harmony with that law. So it, this is just love. And in heaven, it'll be a place that a selfish heart probably wouldn't be happy with, right? Because you, you can't understand that love. Um, he's rejected that love. But then it goes on after this, it says, uh, verse 15, but... He who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. Verse 16, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? But we have what? The mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. That was a long way to get to that point. <laughs> we have the mind of Christ, right? So we can understand the things that God has prepared for us. We can look forward to them. We can, we can appreciate all that's bad in this world isn't just that I don't get, you know, the job all the time or I don't, I get, I get a bad disease or I have to live with whatever. You know, that's not the bad thing. The bad thing has always been sin and the result of it. And, but who can appreciate all that God has, has prepared for us? Those who have the mind of Christ. So, um, The things that he has prepared for us. So that's heaven, right? Now, I'm not sure if we're going to get to heaven today or not. We're going to try. Um, but but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack first. Well, it is. But I want to look at this mind of Christ for just a minute. Philippians 2, 5. And King James uses this phrase several times, but um, some of the other versions have a different word attitude for it. But. First Corinthians or Philippians 2 5. So I'm going to read that. This is a familiar passage. Let this, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Okay. Now, what mind was that? First of all, Paul said, We have the mind of Christ. Now he's, he's saying again, Let this mind be in you, and his, or let this attitude would be a, a good way of looking at that. Then he, then he talks about Jesus for the next few verses who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself down, 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 till finally he was humble even to the point of being obedient to the cross. But he became like us. Now, that's the attitude he wants us to have in us. Not an attitude that is proud. We see where Satan came from. I will be lifted up. An attitude that says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, be always humble under God's hand. I'm always going to be yielding to his will. And that's what Jesus did his whole life. And so down in verse 13, Philippians 4, 13, it says this. I mean, Philippians 2, verse 13. 2, 13. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. How is it that God can do his will in us? Only if we have that attitude that Christ had, that mind of Christ. 
that says, I'm going to now live for God. I'm going to set my mind on things above, not on things on earth. That's just not like paradise above. It's all the principles of above. Set your mind on things above. That's Colossians 1, 3, 1. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are below. Let's look at that in another way. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. We're going to get to dine here. First Peter four, one. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Well, how many want to cease from sin? Amen. There you go. That's a good one. How is it that that happens? Suffering in the flesh. Now that's a that's implying that is the flesh. And how did Jesus suffer in the flesh? Always, and he had a flesh like us made unto the likeness of sinful flesh. He came, and then was he was he following that flesh, listening to, yielding to? He suffered in the flesh. So the suffering in the flesh wasn't just like the nails in his hands, was it? How did he really suffer on the cross? Meant up, my God, God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right, because all the sin, our sin was upon him, and when our sin was upon it, it crushed him. So the sin is ultimately how he suffered in the flesh. But as Romans 8 says, he condemned sin in the flesh when he did that. His perfect life shone through that. He never once, you know, all the sin he bore, our sins he bore in his body on the cross. Peter said, same book here, First Peter. He bore our sins in his body on the cross that we, having died to sin, somehow when he suffered like that, we can suffer like that. And so that's why he says, have the same mind in you. Um, that was in Christ, suffering that way. Verse 2, so as to live the rest of the time. Now he talks about you live long enough the old way, right? But let's live the rest of the time. Um, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for what? Human passions, or mine says the lusts of men, human passions, but for what? The will of God. So we're not just living for lusts anymore. We're living for the Lord. Or I put living for love, right? We live for love because it's God's, the will of God is love God, love man. That's his will. That's his command. So we live for love, not for lust. Would that help you? Now, if you look at the, like the wine when it sparkles in the cup, or if you look at whatever you look at that tempts you, right? It pulls you right in. That's how Satan does it. He puts out his best. He pulls us right in. So what are you supposed to be looking at? God's love, not the lust. We're supposed to be looking at what is God's love all about? And how did he love us so that we can become loving like him? Yeah, the, look at the cross. You see the depth of his love there on the cross. So we, we look at that and we finally, then and then that motivates us, right? To have love fulfilled in our life, not lust. You look at lust and right, we're going to see that, but... It, it sparkles, but what happens in the end? Not so good, right? So I thought I'd get a little pleasure here, but oop, I got caught and look what happened now. I mean, all that is not good. And, and, but love fulfills. And so we want, we want to focus on the right thing. Um, but it's the suffering in the death, in the, in the flesh. Um, how do we live for love and not for lust? We do it by suffering in the flesh with Christ, by somehow dying with Christ. Now, that brings us to death. That's the subject of our whole quarter this year. Um, we die in the flesh. Now, I thought, I thought we spent 13 weeks in here talking about how we don't really die, right? I mean, we sleep. We make a big point of that here. Of that. We sleep. So we get this impression sometimes, I can live like I want now, and then I got streets of gold ahead, and all I'm going to do is sleep for a while. And if that's the impression we get from all this, we misunderstood it. Um, Christ never meant for us to not be able to die, did he? He said, if, if anybody wants to come after me, let him what? Take up his cross and deny himself and follow me. Follow me where? To the cross is where he was going. So you take up your cross, you follow me there. Here's the way to life. I am the way the truth and the life, that was through the cross, always through dying. Let's go now. 
Let's go back to the death part. Um, back to Genesis. I just want to reiterate this. Genesis 2, verse 17. Someone read that. All right, now if you remember our lesson, we studied this, it referenced it a little bit. Um, that word surely is not there in the Hebrew. What is in the Hebrew? And how can you find out? You go to Blue Letter Bible, click on the verse, and I'll give you the, the translation from the Hebrew. He uses the word die twice. It's a verb, dying, basically it's dying, you will die. So the day you eat of it, dying, you will die. So did he die physically that first day? Did he begin dying spiritually? And the dying spiritually is what would cause him to die. Sin causes death, right? Right, so right away, sin had its effect. So now, why didn't God come at this point when, when, when the sin occurred and just forgive him? He could, I mean, he said later, he came and taught through his son, you should forgive how many times? 70 times seven, right? Why didn't he just say, okay, take two, Adam. Let's go through this again. And maybe it took 39 times for them finally to say, okay, we get it. We're not going to eat from the tree. Okay, now we can go forward. Yes. Um, well, uh, lost my train of thought, sorry. <laughs> um, the forgiveness part. Something about forgiveness. No, I think that God, if God, God was willing to forgive, but that sin is still there and it has to be atoned for. Um, you know, because God's law is love. For him to say, yeah, love is not really that important right now. Like, it would go against his character. So I think that, like, I think he just, because in order for him to just say, oh, let's pretend this didn't happen, then, then his character, God's character, eternal character is at stake. And I mean, he's love, period. You know, he doesn't just give love, he is love. So there always has to be an atonement for that. Um, and uh, you know, the way I see it, if he were just to say, ah, oh, okay. Then it would be like, yeah, my love is not really that important. You know, it's just like you can do it sometimes. Um, he did forgive them, but there was still an atonement that had to happen. So let's look at, um, let's say I send a text out, a really nasty text of I hate somebody, you know, something, some group, really hateful. And I think, oh, and, and, and you know, you, you send it out, now it, boom, the text is gone, or, or Facebook, you know, you post it. And let's say I can e erase it. Like forgiveness. What's the problem with that? Because Well, and the, the damage is here, right? The hate that caused me to write something like that. So it's not just, oh, I can, I can take the text back, and then, then it's, it's forgiven, it's whitewashed, it's washed in the blood. So I don't, I don't even know it's there anymore. No, it's because it's still here, right? So the word for forgiveness means release from something. It's not just like, oh, I forget about it. It's release from something. We're in bondage to sin. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they sin changed them. That dying that you will die, the dying process started right then. And the problem wasn't that God needed to forgive them. Was God forgiving? He would have never come down. Uh, and chased after him if he wasn't forgiving. He was forgiving. He, the father was forgiving to the prodigal when he left the house. So God is always forgiving. The problem is we need to be forgiven. So we need the heart change. And that, and that takes something more than just say, I forgive you. It takes a change in the heart. And so let's go on here. So Eve comes along, Genesis. And he only said that to Adam, right? She, she wasn't there yet. So they said, oh, only Eve. Dying, you shall die, singular. You shall die, because there's only one person there. Then Eve comes along, Genesis 3, 3. Serpent's there in the tree and asks her, 
Um, let's read that. Serpent, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty um, than any other beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from the tree of the garden? Uh, any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But, verse 3, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it or touch it lest you die. Now, I don't know if it's a big point, but she only said to die once. God said it twice. Dying you will die. She may have said, because the serpent may be like munching on the fruit, right? I mean, he had wings. We, we say he might have wings. I mean, he, the curse was you have to crawl on your belly. So if you wouldn't crawl on his belly, we think maybe he's flying. But somehow the serpent grabbed the, grabbed the fruit, maybe munching on it. Look, what's his son to me? I'm just a snake and I'm talking, right? And think what it can do to you. And, and so somehow he's, and, and she says, but you didn't die. So she says, aha, you shouldn't um, taste it or touch it or you will die. Just like die. We, and we think of that. The die part is at the end. We die. And we forget that dying is the spiritual part. We're dying. We're dying because we've separated from God and he's come after us. So, so the serpent comes on verse four. So three times this is said, you shall die, right? Uh, God said it. You surely you shall die and you will die. And Eve said it just once you will die. And the serpent's going to say it, but you're going to sneak a one word in front of it. Not, right? You'll not die. And the serpent said to the woman, surely you shall not die. Or you shall not surely die. So in the Hebrew, he said the exact same thing God did. Die and you will die. He said, use plural because now Eve and Adam were there. But it's the same word. Die and you will die. Um, you, and that will not surely happen. What did he say would happen instead? Look at all the benefits you're going to get. I mean, look, you'll become like God. I mean, look at me. I'm just a snake. Think of what happened with you if you just do this. And so he was, and who is a snake, by the way? Let's go. So we got to go all the way to the end, right? Let's turn there with this time. Revelation 12. So all these things are about death. That's, I guess, our point. We're going to try to see what is this about death and what is it about life, and we won't want to miss that um, point before we reflect on heaven. Uh, Romans, uh, Revelation 12, verse 7. And there was what? War in heaven. There we go. Somehow that's... when when Before Eve ate the fruit, she's a-looking, and the serpent had talked to her, and she had... She had she heard the serpent talking, and he asked her questions. She answered him. Had sin entered the world at that point? Before Eve took the fruit and ate it, when she was just talking to the snake, had sin entered the world yet? Through Satan. So we forget that. Sin was already on the world, and God put it on one tree. He said, everything is perfect, but I'm going to let this deceiver come he's going to have access to you only on that tree so stay away from that tree and you'll be safe because he deceived how he deceived a third of heaven right a third of the stars he swept out this dragon so here's the war verse 12 7 uh, revelation 12 7 and there was war in heaven michael now again michael what does his name mean pardon what does it mean the name michael l l is god Michael is one who is like God. And again, it wasn't a question, it's a statement. The one who is like God is the wars. The one who is like God is fighting against the one who is lying about God, the father of all lies. So to answer the lies, God sent the one who is like God, that is his son. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war against the dragon. The dragon and his angels wage war. Let's go to verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent. So now it's going to tell us who this serpent is, right? The dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan. So we got four different labels now. We know who this is. Who does what? Who deceives? He's going to do two things here, notice. He deceives, right? And he's doing that to Eve. He deceives us. Does he ever, does he ever portray the full wear of sin? Here's what's really going to happen. Oh, he never does. 
He wants to hide. He just wants to show you the little. Remember Balaam and Balak? Don't show him the whole um, camp of Israel. He's just show him a little part of it. And maybe he can curse that part. And, you know, Satan's like, oh, I'll show you a little part. Because if you see the whole thing, you probably won't like this. I'm going to just show you enough. And But he deceives, right? He, how many does he deceive? He deceives the whole world. That's everybody he deceives us. Um, he deceives the whole world. He has been thrown down to this earth. Okay, that's how he got on the tree. He got thrown down to this earth. Yes. Correct. He was lying about God, and he did it in the garden there. He continued that same lie. Has God not said, you know, that you shall surely, he's saying one God lies, one God's holding something back from you. Because if you go this other route, you'll achieve more than you would if you follow God. To be as God, yes. Well, no, and I assume God, because they somehow knew all the language, you know, we don't know when they learn to talk, like a little baby has to learn, you know, my, my 100 first words. Somehow God created Adam and Eve with that same language. They understood him talking. So all of that they would have understood. Maybe God gave them a, like a pocket dictionary. Look that one up. Um, and see what that means. Or he would explain it. So the Bible, very brief, you know, when you said this is what God said. But God, to be sure, had, had introduced the world to, to Adam and Eve. And never seen it. But, but it is one of those things you trust. And God said, Here's, you'll stop living, you know. Um, didn't exist in the universe. The dying part started. Satan even, right? The dying you will die, that part had already started in Satan. The dying you will die. He didn't die yet. And we've tried to show that earlier in the quarter. Why? Because if, if he had died right when he had sin, he cut himself out from God, that would have caused death. Again, everyone would have misunderstood. They would have looked at, yes. But that'd be a whole long discussion there on that one. That would be a whole long <laughs> so I'm just saying maybe they did in fact know what death was. Um, what a, where, where is this to say that? Like, you don't say this a lot, but you, if you look through everything, we have proof of people here before Adam and Eve in this world of spirit of being. You know, Adam and Eve is the first one God created the world on into it. Spirit of God. But that'll, that'll be this afternoon discussion. <laughs> but because we, it's, um, yeah, biblically, it starts with Adam and Eve. Um, they're, so where are we at? So this deceiver, he does one thing, he deceives. Let's see the second thing Satan does. And I heard a loud voice, verse 10, Revelation 12, 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, and here's a good part. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ have come down for the accuser. So what else does he do? He accuses, right? So first of all, he trips you, you fall in the mud, and then he's going to tell you how dirty you are. God could never love someone so dirty. So he's the accuser of the brethren. Zechariah 3 clearly talks that he's the accuser of the brethren. He, look at how filthy he is. And God said, oh, I, I don't care. I rescued him out of the fire. He's mine. And I can take care of the dirt. I can strip off the, the old garments. I can put on a new one. God can take care of all that. But Satan's the accuser of the brethren. Now, of our brethren, the accuser of our brethren, that's all of us, has been thrown down who accuses them before God day and night. And they, that's, that's our brethren, that's all of us, and they overcame him, how? Three things. By the blood of the lamb, the testimony, their testimony, and they did not love their life. Let me read it. And they did not love their life even to death. So, Somehow they went through a dying part. They didn't love life enough. They were readily to die. How did they overcome? Through the blood of the lamb. 
We got to understand that because that's how we overcome. What is this blood part about? Did God just need to see somebody die? Did God need to see somehow someone shed blood? Did that make him happy? What does the blood represent? Life always represents life. Leviticus 17, 11 says, how is it that God makes atonement for us? He makes it through the blood by means of the life that's in the blood. It's the life that makes atonement for you. Not the blood. He shed his blood. That's his shed his life for us. It was his life, his perfect life that he gave for us. He lived, he gives us now. All of that is how, how we can become atoned. We can become um, changed with God. How sin can be forgiven is through his life. So it's through the blood of the lamb they overcame. That's the overcome by the life of the lamb. If you want to put that in there, it's always see life in blood when you read that. Um, that's how they overcome. So now let's get back here. Back to Genesis 3. All right, we got five minutes to get to heaven here. Genesis uh, 3. You remember the story. So Eve came and she thought she was going to get something. And what happened when she did? Well, here's what she thought. Genesis 3, verse 6. So he's deceiving her, verse 5. Um, For God knows that the day you eat, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Part truth, right? Because they did start to learn evil. And God knew about evil. He didn't experience it like they did. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that it was good for food, that it was delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable... To make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate it. And what happened? But initially, she probably thought this this is probably happening, right? I mean, what happens if you like eat a piece of bread just like sitting down next to a trash pile? Now, let's take that same piece of bread and you're like this fancy restaurant. The ambiance is good. You had to pay like $100 for that piece of bread. How does it taste now? So much better, right? Because it's a whole environment. So here, this whole environment around her is what's doing it. And, oh, we don't have time, but this goes into like dopamine in the brain. So, right? Got dopamine is one of those neurotransmitters that runs our brain. And it, it, it helps us to seek after things that keep us going, feeding and breeding. So we eat, mmm, this is good. And the dopamine comes and it says, I want you to eat again, because if you don't eat, you're going to starve, right? and breeding. So if you don't breed, then there's just Adam and Eve, right? So somehow that's how Mr. Skunk, you know, on Valentine's Day goes all the way across the highway to try to find Mrs. Skunk because there's something about what God put in us. And it's that dopamine that keeps reinforcing that behavior. So what happens when sin comes along? It like supercharges that release of dopamine. So it's like you use drugs and you get like twice the dopamine release. You use methamphetamine, you get 10 times the dopamine. So it goes way up your brain, and, and then you can't live with that, right? So your body, like, lowers your regular dopamine. So when you're not getting that sinful stimulus, then we're, like, really down. Like, Ugh, I don't like anything anymore. So then you have to go back and get that sin, that thing that appeals to you, to try to get that, that drive back again. And that's the whole nature of sin, and it, it goes down and down until finally you have to do your sin just to try to get some sense of pleasure. It used to give this really high... And that's what happened to Eve right here. And the brain is happening. All those little things happen. It caused her to sin in such a way she, was, she, she did not trust God, nor could she at this point anymore. She could have. It was all there, but she fell for it. So what did God do? He comes down, right? He comes down like he had before. He comes down in the cool of the evening. He comes down to worship. Right. But he's coming down now, because I'm having to skip ahead. We won't finish this. He's, he's coming down, and he's, he's looking. He's seeking for them, right? Adam, where are you? They always greeted him, right, with all the animals and all the birds and the sunset, all singing praise to God. And when God came, they always did that. And now they're all doing that, but Adam's not there. So he's, he's searching for Adam. And as he searches, he grabs a, a little lamb in his arm, right? 
and he's going to search for Adam. Where are you, Adam? And Adam said what? I heard the sound of you, your voice, and I was afraid when I heard it. You're supposed to love God's voice. Now he's afraid of it, and he's hiding. And so God does, and he comes after him, and he comes and finds Adam, and he clothes him with the skin of that little lamb, and he talks to him about his plan and die for him and give him life again so that he would put enmity where we once were now we're in love with sin and we're in love with that and trying to run our own ship and we don't have to listen to god anymore now we're going to do it our own way god's going to come and change all that again so we'll love god again and we'll hate sin and that all that happens through this little lamb giving his life for us that's that's all this life about now i'm gonna we have to skip a bunch of stuff that was the ding. Oh, let's do one more. I'll close with this because it's a pregnant verse, and I love it. James. It's a verse that has four different words in it for reproduction and birth. And I, that's my, I like that. James 1. Okay, James 1 verse, um, somewhere in here. 15. Talking about temptation and we're carried away, drawn away by our own lusts. Um, that's what Eve did by doing it her own way. Verse 15, then when lust has conceived, that's first word, and it has to do with a very close embrace. And you have a close enough embrace, someone gets pregnant. I mean, that's just what happens. So the, the idea is a very close embrace, but that's first word. So when lust has conceived, when lust, you go after something and you embrace it close enough to yourself, that what's going to happen? It's going to conceive. And what's it going to conceive? When lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So you think it's this cute little baby. You see it on the ultrasound and it's little cute little thing work, you know, 10 weeks old, it's wiggling around like a teddy bear and 20 weeks you see it. And, and by 30 weeks you see an ultrasound, you see actually see the face of the baby and you think this is going to be great. And it gives birth to what? Some horrible monster. I mean, trisomy 13, it's a baby that can't live, it's, it's sin. And so you think all along, oh, isn't this cute? You know, I'm going, getting away with this activity and look at the pleasure I get every night. And it's all of a sudden, it's sin is what it's producing. So what happens when sin goes on? Each one is tempted when he's carried away. Oh no, then lust is conceived. It gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, now that's another birth term. It means full term, like the nine months have come up. So ahead of time, you see all these little cute pictures, but when it finally gives birth, it's going to give birth to what? Yeah. When sin is accomplished. So when sin is fully mature, nine months now, and it's going to finally get away from the body, the giving birth is the fourth term there. When sin, um, it brings forth, is the fourth term, it brings forth death. So instead of a cute little something, we get sin that actually brings death. That's all about it. So how many of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? All. So we all get death. And the only way to go through that process is with Christ. He bore our sin. We die with him. Now we can live with him. Now we can have the mind of Christ. Now we can receive the spirit and live by his spirit. Now we can say yes to God instead of just choose our own way. All of that happens in Christ. Read Romans 6. We don't got time. Yes. Have to make it brief. We have to die daily. Paul, 1 Corinthians 4. Always caring about my body, the dying of Christ, that the life of Christ might be manifest in me. That's it. That's the death sin. Paul said, I die daily, but he said, I always caring about. Not when, always. That means when, when, they ad, when the ad flashes up on your computer, that means when you're hurting because whatever happened, always I care about the dying of Christ in my body. That means I'm going to always set my mind on you, Lord, God. I'm going to do what Christ did. I need his mind. I need every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. First Corinthians 10, I need that. And so I need that, and I can do that only through Christ. So he lets me now set my mind on him. And now I can say yes to love instead of yes to lust. And that's how I live. Every day I carry about in my body the dying of Christ that I keep saying yes to God uh, as Christ did. And that's how the life of Christ can be manifest in us. Now, to those people, and here we got to close. Now I'm ready. We'll go to heaven. To those people, because we could talk about all day, but I, I got this um, 
to those people comes this statement. And these are two little quotes I got. One from the book Maranatha, with my mom's favorite devotional book um, from Mrs. White. It's a collection. Maranatha about the Lord coming. The whole book's about his coming. You can get it online. You can read it for your devotions this year. Just, you know, Maranatha every day. But this comes from Maranatha, November 7. And it starts with a verse. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Now, that's the joy of the Lord. It's the Lord's joy to let us in. His children coming back home. That's his joy. And we can be entered into that joy. As your senses delight in the attractive loveliness of earth. I mean, think of, I'm going to the Philippines here in two months. I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to go diving under the water. I'm, a, I'm looking forward to all the joy, the beauty of nature I'm going to see. As your senses delight in the attractive loveliness of earth, think of the world that is to come that shall never know the blight of sin or death, where the face of nature no more wear the shadow of curse. Let your imagination picture the home of the saved and remember that it will be more glorious than your brightest imagination can portray. In the varied gifts of God in nature, we see but the faintest gleaming of his glory. It is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But his spirit has given them to us. Then I saw, and here's a, a flash to heaven. She saw this in her early writings. This is the book. Then I saw a very great number of angels bring from the city glorious crowns, a crown for every saint. His name written there. Revelation talks about that. As Jesus called for the crowns and the angels presented them to him, with his own right hand, uh, the lovely Jesus places the crowns on the head of the saints. In the same manner, the angels brought the harps and Jesus presented them to the saints. The commanding angels struck the first note and then every voice was raised in grateful, happy praise. Revelation talks about that. Revelation 4, every voice around there, a throng that no man can number uh, were crying out praises to the Lamb. And that's the scene. Then I saw Jesus lead the redeemed company to the gate of the city. He laid open the gate and swung back its glittering hinges and, and bade the nations that had kept his truth to come in. Within the city, there was everything to feast the eye. Rich glory was beheld everywhere. Then Jesus looked upon his redeemed saints. Their countenances were radiant with glory. And as he fixed his loving eyes upon them, he said with his rich musical voice, I behold the travail of my soul and am satisfied. This rich glory is yours to enjoy eternally. Your sorrows are ended. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. There shall be no more, not any pain. I saw the redeemed host bow and cast their glittering crowns at the feet of Jesus. And then as his lovely hand raised them up, they touched their golden harps and filled all heaven with rich music and songs to the Lamb. I then saw Jesus leading the people to the tree of life. And again, we heard his lovely voice, richer than any music that's ever fell on mortal ears, saying, the leaves of the trees of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. Eat ye all of it. Upon the tree of life was the most beautiful fruit of which the saints could freely partake. In the city was a most glorious throne. What do we call that throne? Hebrews 11 or 4. The throne of grace the throne of God's goodness and gifts to us, the throne of grace. I saw the throne of grace from which proceeded the pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal. On each side of the river was the tree of life on the banks of the river and with beautiful trees bearing fruit. Language, and here's my last, we're going to close here. Language is altogether too feeble to attempt a description of heaven. How did John try to describe it? 1 John 3, 1, he said, behold what manner of love. Just got to look at the love and try to imagine it. Love is altogether too feeble to attempt a description of heaven. As the scene rises before me, she was seeing this in vision. As the scene rises before me, I'm lost in amazement. Carried away by the surpassing splendor and excellent glory, I lay down my pen and exclaim, oh, what love, what wondrous love. The most exalted language fails to describe the glory of heaven or the matchless depths of the Savior's love. That's what we, 
when we think about heaven, you ought to think about the depths of God's love. And what a place it'll be to be living in a place where it'll be love, only love. And we'll be able to share in that for eternity. Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful for the depths of your love that you, you caused you to create this world, Lord. And when we sinned, it caused you to go after Adam. And your love, Father, finally sent your son to die for us, that if we just believe and trust in him, we can have his life even today. Oh, we pray, Lord, that we might always carry about in our bodies the dying of Christ, that we might always say yes to your spirit, and we might present our bodies as living sacrifices to you, and we might yield them to you, Lord, that we can live with Christ, that we can live now today and share your love with others, and someday, Lord, live in that wonderful place that you're preparing for us. We thank you for this in your wonderful name of your son. Amen.